So when it comes to FODMAPs, so I'm not sure, has anyone heard of FODMAPs in the crowd? Okay, good, a good chunk of people. So FODMAPs are fermentable types of carbohydrates. Um, the long version is uh, fermentable oligo, dye, monosaccharides, and polyols. So these are various types of carbohydrates that are poorly absorbed in your small intestine. So what happens if you think about for patients who have IBS, it could be patients with celiac disease, Crohn's disease, if things are not getting broken down in that small intestine, whether there's inflammation um, or some food that you might have consumed that um, kind of exacerbated those symptoms, these foods are going to ferment in your large intestine. And so I like to call it, you're having a beer brewery in your large intestine. So you're having a lot of the rumbling, the gas, the bloating, and loud noises that someone could hear across the room. And we've known for over 100 years or 200 years, who knows, about lactose. So many patients will report, I drink milk, I have ice cream, I am so gassy, I am so bloated. So we know about lactose. We're starting to find more and more patients that are having issues with fructose. Again, high fructose corn syrup is in a lot of foods. They're starting to take that out. But that is a huge thing that causes GI issues in patients. Fructose and natural fruits as well. Um, fructans, we'll talk a little about in the next slide. Um, again, those are things like your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, your garlic, things like that that could cause gas and bloating. Um, the polyol, some of the sugar-free gums and things that patients don't think about, that that can cause more gas and bloating. And then your galactins, which are your beans and your lentils. So I like this depiction from Patsy Katz who's a dietitian out on the East Coast. And she always likes to explain it with a bucket. So everyone's different and everyone can tolerate certain foods. But when your bucket overfills and you have too many things in, the, in these different categories throughout the day, you might be very gassy and bloated. So this is a, um, another slide that shows those various FODMAPs up at the top. And what happens if someone consumes these and they already have some different GI issues, this is going to affect that osmotic load. So it's going to pull water into your intestine and cause a lot of distension, gas, bloating. Um, you might have wind, which, they, uh, which that is gas in Australia, um, and pain and discomfort. So these simple foods, and so what I think is very interesting is those fructans, um, those are where your wheat, rye, and your barley are. So patients will report, I feel so much better on a gluten-free diet. So it may not be the gluten, which is protein. That's not fermentable. It's the rest of those foods that have uh, gluten. So the wheat, rye, and barley, it's mostly carbohydrates. So what's in those carbohydrates are highly fermentable. So this could be why patients feel better um, on a gluten-free diet. And they, again, they proved this in Australia. They, they compared a regular diet for IBS to the low FODMAP diet, and these patients, or I'm sorry, and, they, and they, these patients that thought they had gluten issues, and they gave them gluten, and these patients had no symptoms. Um, it was just the, the fermentable carbohydrates. So again, I'm going to talk a little about the specific carbohydrate diet. It was described in 1951 by Dr. Sidney Haas. Um, it was popularized by Elaine Gottschall in 1987. She had a, her first, first uh, book was Food and Gut Reaction, and it's been, multiple, uh, it's been um, published multiple times since then. It addresses the inflammation and malabsorption, and, and the goal is to deprive those microbes in the intestinal tract from their energy. So it's supposed to starve those bad bacteria. Um, on the slide, as you'll see, there's a ver various things that are allowed. It's mostly fruits, vegetables, um, nut fl flowers, and, be and bean flowers, and things like that. And then what's a challenge for some patients, and some might feel better in this, but they cannot have any grains. They cannot have any potatoes. Um, so no rice, no potatoes, no grains whatsoever. They can make various things out of the nut and the bean flowers, um, but they have to stick to this very strict diet. There was three studies that came out of Rush in the past couple of years. The first looked at just 18 patients looking at the bacterial fingerprints in their fecal samples. And they found that those with ulcerative colitis had the most different microbiome. So they had a very uh, d diverse microbiome with more of that good bacteria with on the specific carbohydrate diet. They did a bigger study looking at double the patients and they did find again, with the patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis on the SCD diet, they did have, again, a very diverse population of bacteria versus the control patients. They last did a case series on 50 individuals with IBD throughout the country, and they looked at these patients, again, through the survey. They did get their pathology to, to confirm that they did have IBD. 
And these patients were on the diet for the meantime about three years. Most of them took about nine months to actually heal on the diet and feel better. Um, and these patients, 22 of them were not on medications. Again, their limitation in this is many of these patients were in remission. Um, so they need to do more studies on this. But it is very interesting, as the author noted, that the diet does have the potential to alter your microbiome, as the study of Dr. Chang at UFC. So it is a low-cost intervention to, to decrease that bad bacteria, the dysbiosis in IBD. Another diet, um, the IBDA diet, so this is done at the University of Massachusetts. She basically did an altered SCD diet, and so she allowed things such as a little bit of oats in the diet. She talked about the probiotics and the prebiotics, which I talk about. She, oh, she talked about the types of fats. She looked at the, the different nutrient deficiencies of these patients, and then she also modified those foods. So she, she altered the fibers so that you didn't just avoid all fruits and vegetables, but you manipulated them so you can incorporate into the diet. And out of those 11 patients in the small study, 100 percent had had improved symptoms so again this needs to be replicated and they didn't look at the bacteria and the mucosal healing um, or the gut flora but it was a very interesting start for a diet so again what's the optimal diet for IBD looking at the healthy types of carbohydrates so avoiding those excess sugar the juice the candy and increasing some of those soluble fibers as tolerated looking at some of the healthy fats because again Fat and protein will not cause gas and bloating um, as much as those carbohydrates. And looking at those healthy types of proteins, the fish, uh, the, a little bit of red meat as tolerated, and some of the poultry um, and nut butters and eggs. So again, eating all the colors of the rainbow. And as I mentioned today throughout the talk, the diet and nutrition has a role in IBD. It needs to be individualized, and future research needs to be done on diet and IBD. Thank you.